Hi everybody, uh, my name's uh, Jim Northey. Uh, let me see if I can get back to the uh, slides here. Um, and I want to back up a bit. Can we go back to the beginning here? Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Jim Northey, and I'm the uh, global one of the Global Technical Committee co-chairs of the FIX uh, Standard Organization, and I'm also um, su surprisingly the uh, chair of ISO TC68, which is responsible for all all the financial uh, services standards globally, even even some of the ones that. Uh, Rich Robinson besmirched before me. Um, and uh, so um, what I want to talk today about is, is open source and open standards and sort of take a looking, sort of through the looking glass approach. So let me see. Uh, all right, there we go. I probably hit that one too many times. So, so my conjecture today, going back from uh, one of my... Uh, uh, Readings from undergraduate school, uh, Karl Popper, Conjectures and Refutations. You know, my conjecture is is that um, the uh, open standards are good, open source is good, but when you're able to combine open source and open standards, uh, I think you really have something, and I switched languages here, so we go outside the standard language and switch to Portuguese. You know, you have the best of both worlds, open standards and open source. And so, and Rich sort of mentioned this um, because I think he stole my slide. He saw me working on it earlier. Um, they're really about both about community. And um, yes, I, I am a recovering consultant, uh, the 12-step program now for, for recovering consultants. But um, I think there's something really important there because... Uh, it seems like communities, uh, um, you know when you're in a good community, but most people don't introspect and uh, take a step back and actually think about what makes up a good community. And I think uh, Rich has made a very good point. You can have open communities that are completely closed. You can have other closed communities which are so open. So I think we have to really understand what we're talking about with open. And so I want to go back a little bit uh, further and talk about some things that make up community. And I want to go back to sort of, uh, so I'm an old guy. Uh, hopefully I won't be doing this too much longer. Um, but I started reading and I came into the industry in the 1970s. It's it just a really great time. For, uh, for technology innovation. And one of those books was The Psychology of Computer Programming. And these titles still have relevance today, even though they're part of sort of our history. Peopleware by Tom DeMarco, Cathedral and Bazaar, of course. Uh, that's probably why we're here. Uh, but there's a, there's a book that I think I would recommend anybody who's interested in creating a viable open community that, that can actually produce. And that's a book by Peter Hinchins, Named Social Architecture. If if and if and if uh, any of you don't know Peter's name, unfortunately Peter passed away a few years ago. Um, Peter was one of the key architects of something called AMQP, which is still important. But he left AMQP, and he left AMQP because of the the community issues and and, and around that. And he created something called Zero MQ. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Zero MQ. But, but he purposely used Zero MQ to also research sort of the social psychology and how to build effective communities around open source and open standards. So I recommend that book to you. And then also The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks. How many of you know, have heard of The Mythical Man Month, the book? Oh, that's pretty good. There's a bunch of old people too in the audience with me. Good. So, you know, so where to start with this community? And some of the themes that, that you take away from social architecture book are one, start with a compelling problem. Start with a problem that people will want to work on even if they're not paid. All right? Start with something. If you don't have a compelling problem or something that needs to be solved, then uh, you might as well stop. The other thing, and, and this really goes to the heart of what I, why I think the fix, how many would argue that the fix protocol was reasonably successful? Anybody? Show of hands, the fix was fairly successful. It's 27 years old now. Um, the, um, you have to establish some sense of fairness 
and this word openness, where your contributions can be heard. You're not going to be biased to one person. One, one person in a dominant role can kill an open source project. We've seen it time and time again. Open standards. One, one entity can, can dominate and control standards to where people won't participate anymore. So this, there's a key structure. And fairness shouldn't be a default thing. It should be put in, in design. And when the FIX organization started, we had Solomon and, and uh, Fidelity. We had a buy side and a sell side and said, why are we all going to build all these interfaces as we're starting to move away from the telephone and moving to electronic trading? And uh, what they decided to do is when they said, all right, we got to have an organization around this, they had, here's a buy side leader, here's a sell side leader. And it's not only about who you include, it's who you excluded. Who did FIX exclude in the early years? They excluded vendors. Who else did they exclude? They, ex they excluded the exchange community. They wanted to focus on just the consumers, the people who needed to solve the problem. And I think that access and that openness really has uh, carried forward. And I would encourage all those people interested in FinOS and, and these other initiatives to sort of uh, take some lessons from, from that structure. The other key I think it is, and, and we saw that with FIX and we've seen it with many other open source issues, is deliver early. Get, get some initial feedback and get something going that you can get out there and refute in the market. And then so the question we always struggle uh, with in uh, the FIX world now 27 years on, is what do we do about the free rider problem? Okay, what do we do about the free rider? But I would tell you that through the looking glass, even though the free rider problem is off studied in economics, um, you know, the current trend is, is we have multinational corporations that are actually largely riding, uh, having a free rider problem. But when you think about it from our perspective, what would Linux be without free riders? You know, who imagined today, and I just learned this a couple, I, I was doing some work uh, and I finally made peace with something called Maven. I hate that. You know. So I finally have accepted that Maven exists and it, and it actually seems to be making my life better now. Anyway, what was amazing was when I went to install that, uh, you can run a Linux subsystem on any Windows 10 platform. Not only that, when you go to install it, you can pick from any one of the distributions. I mean, that's incredible. You know what? I don't view that everyone in open source and open standards should say, we want the free rider opportunity. All right? I mean, I think that's, I, I think that's key. And, and we can look at, the, uh, one, from a history standpoint, of something called quick fix. I don't know if anybody out there uses the fix protocol. Anybody use fix at all in the audience? Got one person up there, okay. Um, well, uh, before, before we get into quick fix, so I do want to talk about these key themes. One is, in the Peopleware book, you, we talk about the environment in which to work. And why I like that book is, is uh, DeMarco and Lister start out and they say, uh, hey, we have no idea how you can get team gel. But all we know is without Team Gel, your project's not going to succeed. So they say, we don't know what can create Team Gel, but we can give you a list of things that will be guaranteed to kill Team Gel. And one of those things that they, they mentioned will kill Team Gel, and I see it in every company I go to now, is the open office environment. You know, to me, open office environments are the anathema of, of software development. So the, uh, the other th book I'm going to talk about, Mythical Man Month from Fred Book, he had the structure for a chief programming team. I would argue that most open source projects now are self-organizing versions of the chief programmer team, where you have a couple key committers on top and many other people involved in the process, and you organically build, and these things are allowed to come together. We don't have to talk about the Cathedral and the Bazaar. The book is probably why we're here. Uh, one of the things that's oft overlooked is the power of GitHub. I mean, so, if you went to a bunch of software de developers today and said, okay, that's all fine, but we're going to have to have code inspections and official walkthrough meetings, all right, you'd find yourself out on the street. On the other hand, if you say, okay, we've got a few key committers, and if anybody's going to commit something, they're going to have to do it by way of a pull request, which basically is a code walkthrough, uh, they'll say, oh, yeah, that's great. Pull requests are cool. 
So, and then uh, the other key is, of course, social architecture, which I, th I encourage you all to take a look at because this is a person who developed many open source software projects. And then he t took a step back. He said, let's really think about communities and what it takes to make one and, and make a viable product and standard. So, so when we look at this case study that I'm trying to say open standards and open source, I want to start with fix. Case study number one. So there was this thing called Quick Fix. It started in 2001 and 2002 by Warren Miller and Jim Downs, and it was actually funded by a small company called ThoughtWorks. I think they're like 5,000 people now globally. And it was one of the first major financial markets open source products. Quick Fix J came along later by Steve Bates. It's now made by, maintained by Christoph Johns at McDonald's Associates. We also have many variants. When I would go around the world teaching uh, Fix, I would ask people, how many use Quick Fix? And about three quarters of the audience globally would, would, would raise their hand. And, uh, and so, so the question is, in the Fix organization, there's our standard on the web page, and here's the Quick Fix page. The, the question I always ask is, would Fix have been as successful of a protocol, and it is the default language of, tra of the trading industry now, without Quick Fix? And, and I, I would argue not. And I, I will go a step further. If, if there was a, a, a good copyleft license, uh, the number of global multinational publicly traded exchanges that would have to open, raise their hand and admit they're using quick fix as their fix interface would be, people would be astounded and, and amazed by that. So, so my first case to you is uh, that um, the fix standard itself shows the power of open source combined with an open standard. And then the next case I want to, want to start to talk about is, is this is an anticipatory standard, meaning we're trying to build a standard, is something called Fix Orchestra. And what did I say at the beginning? You have to start with a real problem that people can embrace and understand. And the Fix Protocol, it was started by a bunch of people who weren't standards people. They said, we just need to get together. So our standard was loosely specified. We didn't have conformance tests. I learned a valuable lesson from uh, the National Institute of Standards when I was diverted to work on the smart grid. And, and the key there was your standard is measured by conformance to that standard and what your conformance tests are. Anyway, so within FIX, we, we, have a, uh, we usually document these things by human readable documents that, in short, are sparse on information and not directly actionable. So it's created multiple pain points throughout the life cycle. I'm gonna move through quick here looking at my time. And so, you know, what we have is operational efficiencies. And another thing is to have a really good analogy that you can use to explain things to What Fix Orchestra, how many can, are old enough to remember when you get a new ethernet card and plug it in and have to put different dip switches, you had to download drivers, you got a new printer, you had to download drivers. All of that was replaced by plug and play standards and technologies and drove that. What we're trying to bring to fix now is no one's gonna, we know that no one's gonna be uh, rewriting their fix infrastructure. It's dial tone, you know? I mean, fix is equivalent to voice over IP at this point. It's, it's so buried that no one's gonna make any major investments, but there still is all this inefficiency at, at a higher level. So our assumption is that we need to come up with some mechanism that sits over the top of there. So again, Make sure you test your assumptions of the community and the solution you're proposing. And we have a set of assumptions that we've made for the standard. And so what does Fix Orchestra do? It's a standard for exchanging machinable, re readable rules of engagements. One of the other assumptions we made, which I think was important, is that this machine readable specification, if I'm gonna invest any time and money into it, it better be support a heck of a lot more than Fix because there's about 150 different proprietary protocols. So we made sure that Fix Orchestra could be used for basically any type of messaging, because if you're gonna do any automation, even if you're starting at the grassroots level and just doing scripting, you'd sure like to know it could be used for, uh, for any type of messaging protocol, including your internal messaging. And so, so Orchestra content is all, all machine readable, and more importantly, it's open. Open source and open standards. And uh, coincidentally, uh, you know, this event's being sponsored by GitHub, but we, we're moving all of our technical standards to GitHub, uh, we, and that wasn't a novel idea. We, uh, we followed um, the uh, W3C, which moved there using Markdown and publishing. So, 
you know, fig, we're not uh, uh, beyond uh, climbing onto any good idea out that we see out there. So another case study, fix latest. We actually ended up with a problem where uh, we made a couple decisions to break backward compatibility. In, in, in the modern age now, um, you know, backward compatibility isn't important. You get a new release of a language, even if it's a point release, you'll find out it breaks. You know, you look at TypeScript and some of these other things. There is no concept of continuity and, and, and backward compatibility. Anyway, we made a couple of roadblocks and we broke it. So, so what we did was uh, we, uh, to solve this problem, we actually came out with the concept of fixed latest. And again, we're refactoring the specification every time we extend it. Every, any new, new tag, any new field, any new message that gets, uh, gets published. And if you look at the open source places, again, open source, uh, we use uh, GitHub Markdown. We use Pandoc to convert these into those pesky documents that humans like to see, those PDF frozen in time documents. Orchestra, open source, open standard. Orchestra tools that we put in the open source, and then we also have some orchestra tools that are available just to the community. And this, the next one I'll talk about is, is a third case study, is something we call Conga. The issue is, is that fix is the language of trading, but not many people are very interested in having session level protocols and having to have a fix engine. So what we did was we created the, the Conga proof of concept, which takes the fix latest data dictionary, that's all the hundreds of messages available in fix, or fix two, four two, please don't use that anymore. Um, JSON and simple binary encoding, uh, and you can pick which encoding you want, and it runs over our fixed high performance session layer and, and web sockets. So in this demo, which is available on Apache 2.0, we threw in something just a little extra to make it interesting. It has a full matching engine. So what we wanted to do, what, what we did is I did an analysis of 85 of the cryptocurrency exchanges. And what I did was I saw a love evolution. Everyone started with a RESTful interface. Then they soon realized, well, trading is not a RESTful type thing. You're not talking to a resource. So then they started to move the web sockets. Then you would see in their evolution, they'd start moving to web sockets with heart beating because you realize you need to have a key plot. And pretty soon, they pretty much, through a learning curve and, and wasting a lot of time, they've replicated a large part of the, uh, the fixed standard. So we put this out there for the community. Again, the idea of open source plus open standards. Okay, and there it is, just the proof in the pudding. So uh, open source plus open software. And then, uh, I've got about um, eight minutes here. So next I want to talk though about the data conundrum. Now, so I think most of that before that was pretty good news and, and a, a good approach, but now we have this, uh, it's, it is about the data. You know, it's so easy now because of open source to encode a message, to get messaging. I mean, um, you know, use your JSON or simple binary encoding, all with very strong open source implementations, run them over your Kafka bus, you can encrypt that. You, I mean, you can get something up and running quickly. The issue is the content of the data and the value of the data and the, and the semantics and context under it is the key. But, so how many have seen this cartoon? This is one of my, my favorites. So, you know, it's a situation there are competing standards and it's at 14 ridiculous, we need a standard to develop one universal standard that covers every one of the use cases. We said, yeah. And then the next thing you know, we have 15 standards. Well, so I was, right after the credit crisis, I was testifying before the CFTC. And to my right was a gentleman who's very much involved in international standards. I won't mention Rich, Richard Soley's name because I don't want to embarrass him. Anyway, Richard, uh, who I've known since the, and again, I, I'm really old. How many of you guys remember the Com Corba battles? Anybody here? Anybody remember Microsoft Com versus Corba? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so I was kind of on the Corba side, you know, uh, with Richard actually, and then there's a Microsoft. Little did we know the answer was going to be none of the above. That, that was actually the choice you should have you should have chosen. Anyway, so we're sitting there, uh, and uh, Richard goes, "The problem is you have an N plus one standards problem in your industry," and and. Richard's a very compelling speaker, by the way. And he says, and so he said, great. He goes, so how are we going to solve this N1 plus 1 standard problem? And he's testifying. And so the testimony's recorded for posterity. He goes, we're going to create a new standard. 
And so anyway, so I just turned and looked at him and just smiled and gave him a you know, stupid look. I'm pretty good at stupid looks. But anyway, so when it comes to data, which I really think is the key, and I think Rich uh, in the earlier talk also mentioned that, we really do need to address data and semantics because that's the key. But the problem is we've got the EDM Council We've got, with their FIBO, we've got ISDA with their new common data model. We've got the fixed trading community, which has, we don't have a data dictionary, and we're not aspirational to actually sort of try to gather territory, but there's a lot of value in semantics and data that are in those. We have ISO 2022, which actually does have a complete data model of the, uh, the financial instrument business information model is all contained within the ISO 2022 standard. We have Open Figgy, which has an elaborate metadata model. And something I'm really keen on is Actus, which gives an algorithmic definition to, uh, to products and actually defines everything as cash flows, which I think is very valuable. And then on top of this, plop, here comes Finovas financial objects. And what I'm hoping that we can do with this uh, is, is to try to may maybe uh, FinOS can be a point of convergence. I mean, each one of these efforts is good and data, data semantics and context is just nothing but hard work. All right. and, but I'm hoping that maybe we can use this as a point where we can maybe bring some of this stuff together and hopefully we'll have some more conversations. Okay, so about four minutes to go. So fix, our fixed global technical committee focus, just the last word, was what we tried to address this year, operational inefficiencies, getting fixed latest out there so people don't have to worry about fixed versioning anymore, and then fintech disruption. And then 2020 is now we have to go around and tell people what we built out there on, on the, in GitHub land. And so, and I think the problem with trying to communicate anything is trying to get above the din. And what, it's not enough to say, oh, we're going to try to market and let people know and educate them. <laughs> the problem is, is that, uh, and if you haven't seen this movie, you need to see this movie, right? Uh, it's called The Bit Player. It's about Claude Shannon. And he came up with the fundamental information, information model as a, a part of his master's degree thesis. Uh, and uh, what, what's happened at this point now is there's so much information, all information is noise. And so how, it's not enough to say we're gonna go out and market education. It is really difficult to communicate anything out there with the level of uh, information. Our brains aren't designed to take on all this. So everything comes in like static on the radio, Jim White's song. Um, so, Fixed trading community and open source. Uh, what I've tried to com communicate to you today in the short amount of time available was that we see open standards and open source as being partnered and, and uh, important to work together and, and it brings about standardization. It also allows for open source projects to, to compete. Um, and um, this is our overall technical stack as of August 2019 why data becomes important is look, we have several application layers, but then we have multiple messaging codings. We have multiple messaging session layers over multiple transports. And the key here is that um, um, it's the data that rides across all these things that, that, that is, is what's important. And um, it's interesting, what's really good is that many of the FinOS uh, sponsors and founding organizations are the same ones that uh, support the fixed trading organization. So we have two minutes and three seconds left. Any questions about fix and where we're going? Uh, any comment? Yes, sir. Come every company up there is using fix four two. You you're right. And fix four two is well. I, I I will say this, for equity order routing. Okay, fix four two. Um, um, I, I'm going to turn the question around. If, you, if you're doing equity order routing, why would you ever consider moving away from Fix 4.2? And, and there is, there's no compelling reason. And so Fix 4.2 will always be a standard. I think uh, some of you people are young, not many. I'm just, it's nice to see old faces in the crowd. Um, we'll all be retired and Fix 4.2 is going to run because it solved the problem. And I would say don't force a standard or try to change something if you don't have a value proposition and fix 4.2 for equity order routing. Now, when you start going into fixed income, when you start going into other asset classes, fix 4.4 is the key standard. We had some political mistakes because the organization sometimes becomes the tail wagging the dog that created a fix 5.0. What we've tried to do is eliminate all that 
and fixed latest essentially is whatever we define in fixed running over a fixed 4.4 transport. So I think in the world you'll have fixed latest run over fixed 4.4 for, for multi-asset classes, deep post-trade work. There's a lot of work going on in settlement, especially driven by BlackRock and other companies. To actually, And we had this big uh, war and fallout between SWIFT and the ISO community uh, and FIX in 2005. It was covered in the press and it was on. So I took over the ISO relation, SWIFT relationship in 2006 and started to rebuild that. And so when BlackRock came along and said, we're going to push FIX all the way through settlement, um, what, what, what happened was when I started looking at what they were trying to automate, there was no messaging. There's so much of post-trade and settlement and custody that's still a manual process with spreadsheets, telephone calls, and things like this that there's huge opportunities to for everyone. And what we're going to do is try to make sure that that's available no matter if you're using ISO 2022, the SWIFT network, or DTCC, or you're using FIX connected to connect. So anyway, any other questions? Okay, I think my time's up. But thank you uh, very much for your, your time and interest. Thank you. Yeah.